Excuse me. Hello, YouTubers. Joe Kersey here on Wednesday, August 23rd at 12.20 in the afternoon Eastern Time. Now, today I want to tell you well, an extended story, but it talks about several other things along the way, as is often the case here <laughs> on the Joe Kersey channel. Um, I was talking with, uh, I think I was talking with my friend in Seattle the other night, about, oh, a couple, three days ago, <laughs> on Skype. Uh, I might have been I might have been talking with my friend Tony in England. Uh, in any case, I was talking with one of the Tonys, <laughs> and uh, I got thinking about this fellow uh, who, as, as far as I know, he's still alive. And what I'm going to tell you is actually factual, and it's not libelous. So I'll use his name. His name is Ron Miller. Uh, now, Ron Miller has written what is considered the current definitive standard textbook for anesthesia, or edited it, let's put it that way. I don't know what edition it's in now, but I think as of, uh, as of the late 90s, it was either in the second or third edition. Um, now, I met this man on, uh, personally, on two occasions, and indirectly on a third occasion. Uh, he'll, feature, he'll feature later on in the tale. Um, meanwhile, to sort of make sense of some of the things I'm going to tell you, you need to know a bit about how anesthesia residency training was structured, at least when I went through it, uh, and I, you know, I went through it, uh, technically I went through it from 1975 to 1978. The anesthesia part of that was just the last two years, 1976 to 1978. Uh, anesthesia residency now is at least well, four years if you count the first year as an internship year or first year residency type year. Uh, and then uh, any more now, a lot of these guys will do a, a subspecialty year, you know, cardiovascular anesthesia, neurosurgical anesthesia, or they'll do a year of research. But at the time I went through, it was considered a three-year program, and the first year did not have to be in anesthesia. In fact, it, you weren't allowed to do it in anesthesia the first year. Uh, it had to be done in some sort of internship. Now, that could be ideally in either a medical, general medical, or internal medicine residency, or general practice residency, or you could do it in surgery, or basically anything, you know, OBGYN, uh, emergency medicine, uh, but you had to have a year of training that was considered an internship year. Well, I did my first year as a surgery resident, so I did you know, one year of surgery uh, as a first year surgery resident. As part of a surgery program intending to go into surgery, uh, you know, you, after the first three or four months, you have to decide by October of the you know, if you want to carry on for the second year. Uh, by that time, it was clear to me that I just physically was not cut out to do surgery. So I, but Dr. Carey, my chairman, knew that I would decide to go into anesthesia, and I had selected, you know, I talked with the chairman of at Ohio State, Dr. William Hamelberg, and he had accepted me into the program, and, uh, I said that's what I was going to do. Now I thought I'd never see the side of inside of an operating room again after I told Dr. Carey that, but, but 
They treated me very fairly. I got to fully participate in the program. Uh, you know, for the remainder of my time as a surgery resident, and uh, probably, arguably, probably the 12 most valuable months of my life, as far as you know, seeing and doing things. And then I did the two years of anesthesia at Ohio State. All of this is down at Ohio State University. Um, now, you have to understand how the specialty boards are structured in anesthesia then. Now, I don't, I, I, I don't really know how they are now. Well, I sort of do now, and I can get into that a little bit later. Um, but the American Board of Anesthesiology uh, wanted you to do, you know, you, you did your residency, and then uh, in June of the year you were finishing, there was about two, uh, well, no, actually it was, it was in July or August of the year you finished, after, you know, after you finished. Uh, you, took what, you took the written exam, the written board exam which at the time was a series of, uh, it was about four hours long. It was a series of about 150 to 200 of these K-type questions. Now a K-type question is, you, know, you have a question, you have five things underneath it, A, B, C, and, a, B, C D, and E. Uh, well, well, it's actually one, two, three, you know, anyway. The, the answers you give on the answer sheet are A, B, and C are correct. A and C are correct. B and D are correct. Only D is correct. And E, none of the above are correct. In effect, you're getting asked five questions with each question. Up until that time, and since then, since I've never taken a written examination of any variety since then, this was by far the most difficult written examination I have ever encountered. It was fair. Oh, it was very, very fair. But what a bastard. I came out of there just exhausted, and I, I was always pretty good at taking tests. I felt like I'd been beaten up. So that's the written, that was the written part of the anesthesia board exam. It was designed so that probably not over 65% of people would pass it on the first try. So it was made deliberately quite hard. And then, uh, two years later, you have an oral examination, uh, at which you get three whacks. You get three whacks at the written and three whacks at the, at the orals. Or you did then. I don't know what they do now. So to take the orals, you had to have been out actively practicing for two years, which in my case was uh, in September of 1980, since I finished in 78, practiced in well, three places, well, actually, you know, five, I had in, in two cities and in, in five different hospitals in that two-year period. So, uh, it, you know, when it came time to take my oral examination, uh, you know, they only have them in certain cities in the country, you know, uh, the one in September of 1980 was in Boston at the Copley Plaza Hotel. Now, we're going to, we're going to stop right there for a minute and we'll come back, we'll come back to the Copley Plaza in, in the beautiful city of Boston in September of 1980 in a moment. But first I gotta tell you about 
Ron Miller. Now, Ron Miller came to visit Ohio State as just, I don't know, a visiting fireman. I think he gave a talk or he, I don't know what he was in town for. But in any case, he was in our anesthesia department. And since um, I was going to be the brand new assistant professor on faculty in July of 1978, uh, in June of 1978, when he came into the department, was on, came into the operating room and so forth, Dr. Hamelberg walked him over to me and said, this is Dr. Joe Kersey, he's going to join the faculty here in about two weeks, three weeks, uh, he's going to show you around. Now, I, did, I, I knew who this guy was. I had no idea he was in town, and I had no idea that I was going to be tasked with this little endeavor. So you do the usual thing, you know, show here's here's how we do this, you know, here's how we sort of run things, that sort of thing. You know, here's some of our equipment, you know. He looked like he was about ready to throw up when he saw kind of the you know vintage of our equipment. Uh, uh, this this guy was he's uh, I just it's hard, to, it's hard to convey his personality. It's, it's almost as if he, while he's with you and while he's looking at the stuff around you, he's acting as if he is just wading through a fine, thin layer, maybe, maybe not that thin a layer, maybe this thick a layer of dog shit. At that time, it was probably like walking down a Parisian sidewalk. So I, I don't know, maybe the man thought he was back, you know, he was in Paris and he was with me in the operating room halls, who knows. So, you know, I spent, I spent about two hours with this guy and we talked, you know, we talked about other things too and, you know, at that time he was at UCLA. Um, I know later he went up to San Francisco, San Francisco, UCSF. I don't know what he's doing now. But he, he says to me, he says, I know you've been hired on here. So he's, he tries to fucking poach me from, from Ohio State. He says, I know you've been hired on here. He says, but I think you could, you could really fit in out, out in my program at UCLA. And I, you know, I thank you very much, you know, I said, that's very kind of you to say, and I'm very glad you, you know, it's nice to know that that's what you think. And, and uh, I said, but I'm, I myself am very happy to be staying here, you know, watch out what you say. Um, and I said, my, my, my wife, my then wife, would absolutely not want to move out to the West Coast. So I'm going to pause for a moment, then we'll come back. <coughs> so Dr. Miller tried to poach me, <laughs> poach me away from Ohio State. Um, okay, well, I'm not even going to go into what happened at Ohio State after... July 1st of 1980. That's, that's, that's a story for another time and maybe even another place. <laughs> um, so I met Ron Miller. I guess that's the, the point of that. So anyway, so uh, it turns out that you know, it's time to go take my oral exam, you know. I mean, I, was Ohio State, went to Fort Wayne, came back to Columbus at Grant Hospital, and now, you know, Joe's been in practice two years, you know, being a big boy, shoving his all, all his own drugs and everything, and it's time to go take the oral exam in Boston. Now, the oral exam was structured this way then, and again, I have no idea what it's like now. It consisted of two 
30 minute sessions. Uh, the candidate was presented with two clinical cases or case situations or operating room situations or patient care situations or ICU situations and then uh, you're given about 15 minutes to read these cases and then you go in and there are two examiners in the room they're supposed to divide their time equally between each case that you've been given. The, you know, notice the operative verb being supposed to. There's a senior examiner and a junior examiner. The junior examiner may be sort of being an examiner in training. He might be only doing it for his first couple, you know, the first couple of years. You know, he's been being, you know, an oral examiner. Um, the senior examiner was always one of the really big national names in anesthesia. Sometimes the junior examin examiner was also a fairly big national name in anesthesia. And just because of <clears throat> the way they paired, paired these guys up, <clears throat> you know, he just happened to get the junior slot. Nobody was allowed to ask you questions that were directly related to their field of research, their main research interest. Minor research interest, of course, but not their major one. So, for example, Ron Miller, whose major research interest was muscle relaxants and muscle diseases as they affect anesthesia, he, in theory, was not allowed to ask me a single question about anything to do with muscle relaxants or their usage or muscle physiology or, you know, neuromuscular activation of the neuromuscular junction or any of that kind of stuff. In theory. Um, I think you might be able to see what's kind of coming here. Um, now, it turns out I had you know, my two, my two examiners were a fellow named Nicholas Green, who at that time was the editor of what was known as the Yellow Journal, which was the International Anesthesia Research Society Journal. Uh, and also, uh, just as an aside at that time, Ron Miller was editor of what was known as the Green Journal, the Journal of the American Society of Anesthesia, you know, the, the Society of Anesthesiology. So I had Nick Green as a senior examiner and also, interestingly, as a junior examiner, although he was very senior and well-respected and I'd been reading this guy's material for years, a fellow named Harvey Shapiro, uh, who at the time was uh, at the University of Iowa. I don't... He subsequently moved on. He, he's, he, he's moved on several places. I think he went. I think he ended up in San Diego, UC, UC San Diego. I may be wrong. Well, no, I know he was in San Diego at least for a while. Nick Green didn't have too far to go because he's in Boston. He was in Boston, so I guess he just took a cab over or something. I don't know. Given the way he thought about himself, maybe you know God levitated him up from his house and just plopped him there in the hotel room. And then my other two examiners were Ron Miller. Duh, here he's here he is again. And and some sort of non-entity guy that, that it was his first year as a junior examiner, and he, I think he was either from Kansas or Nebraska. I'll tell you, you know, basically he impressed me like a wet snot rag, and I didn't pay too much attention to him. And he, you know, you know he certainly didn't make full use of his 10 minutes of questioning, let's put it that way. Whereas Ron Miller certainly did. Which was fine, because actually, you know, you know, Miller, despite his sort of auteur, you know, his sort of 
you know, not quite overtly arrogant, I'm looking at a piece of shit attitude. Uh, his questions were fair. Now, yes, he did ask me a lot about the neuromuscular uh, you know, junction, neuromuscular blockade and all this kind of stuff. And that was fine because I was very much up on that. Um, uh, essentially, when they're asking questions like that, they just want to be sure you've been reading, reading the literature. You know, you haven't been sitting at home with your thumb up your behind and you know, drinking beer all day. So, those two guys were fairly fair and went fine. So then, and then they were the first two. And then, then it's into, into with Nick Green and, and Harvey Shapiro. Well, Harvey Shapiro couldn't have been a nicer guy. You know, pleasant, fair questions. Oddly, no questions on neurosurgery, which was his research interest. Well, see, he was playing by the rules, you know. I don't know exactly what Nick Green's research interest was except to, you know, be a really dickhead editor of a medical journal. Well, he sort of didn't ask me any questions about how to be a dickhead editor of a medical journal. I mean, he was sort of like pimping me the entire time he was... Uh, you know, Harvey Shapiro used all of his uh, ten minutes and more. It was to the point that it was obviously visibly annoying Green, which I was getting a huge charge out of. Well, so Green sort of... Green got the last bite of the apple at me. Um, and, you know, and, and, and the way it works, if, you know, if, if, if that bell rings, at the 30 minute mark, that's it. Everybody stops talking. Everybody leaves the room. Well, the candidate leaves the room. So you can't finish the sentence. You can't finish the thought. You are out the door. They can't retort nothing. So, Nick Green, I don't, I don't know how we got it. We got on the anesthesia for bronchoscopies, which, which I was perfectly delighted to talk about because I had, I had been trained by these old timers. I knew how to do the old, you know, apneic oxygenation stuff and rigid bronx and the whole deal, you know. This was actually before the widespread advent of fiber optic bronchoscopy anyway. <laughs> so I'm just, you know, carrying on. And so then this last question to me was, how would you do a bronchoscopy on me? And I was so pissed off at this guy by this time. I said, I'd tape you down with furnace tape, and I'd do you completely awake without even a topical local anesthetic in your oropharynx or trachea. Ding! <laughs> well, in any case, uh, they didn't keep you in suspense too damn long because, you know, Y'all went down to the ballroom downstairs, and they handed you out your results. So you knew right you you knew you knew that afternoon if you passed or failed. And the oral exams at that time were designed essentially to only have a pass rate of around sixty percent. Not passed. You were allowed to piss off. You could really piss off one of the examiners, and the other, and then if the other three liked you. Uh, like rated you above the lowest mark. I mean, uh, rated you a mark above the minimum pass mark, you'd pass. Uh, I, I passed. So I passed my anesthesia boards on the first try. So my certificate's dated October 3rd, 1980. And, as it turns out, was the last of the grandfathered in untime limited board certifications that the American Board of Anesthesiology passed out. Because now you have to get recertified through an, you know, in a completely, you know, you know, another examination process every 10 years. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff. you got to get clinical testimony from your colleagues saying, you know, he doesn't smother patients, you know. But I have one of the last of the untimed limited certificates. Now, this is not the last of the story. <laughs> it never is here, is it?
Well, I, I was in the habit of going up to this this you know sort of anesthesia review course every May in Chicago. Lasted five days. You got 50 hours of credit. You know, met all the CME requirements for re state licensure in Ohio and many other states as well. And Ron Miller was giving actually a whole morning's worth of talks at one of these review courses. I thought his attitude was bad when I met him in the late 70s and early 1980, late 19, mid 1980. This was around 1998. Maybe 1997. I think it was 1997. Well, he started, you know, I mean, people would generally flock to hear him because he was, he was one of the na national names. And it's the first lecture of the day, so, you know, most people go to the first couple of lectures of the day before they bugger off to do something else in the late morning, early afternoon. And Okay, well, he, he cops him to, you know, okay, fine. There, there was a smattering of laughter, you know, in terms of just people who were appreciating that sort of, well, yeah, that's, that's how docs kind of talk sometimes. Well, this, this, you know, second lecture comes around, you know, and he, he, he does it. He does it a little bit more obviously to the point that, you know, you know, some guy tried to ask a question and he told him to shut up. That didn't go over well at all. Now, admittedly, it was not question time yet. Fair enough. But shut up was a bit harsh, but okay. And then, by the third lecture, well, one, the room wasn't nearly as Full, which you would expect anyway at a, a lecture that starts at around 11.15 when lunch is at 12.30. But 15 minutes in, he kept saying, I've, now I've got to be sure and get to the airport because I've got to get a plane back to Los Angeles. I've, I've got to get this plane back to Los Angeles. Well, at that point it was like San Francisco. i go got to get back to San Francisco. Kept looking at his watch. <laughs> so around the, uh, well, it had to have been maybe the 25, 30 minute mark <laughs> in this, into this lecture, this talk, whatever. He was being actively booed. You know, people were, were going, boo! You know, it's like, it's like boo! Sounded like the Chicago stockyards in there. And people were getting up and leaving. You know, you know, by actual count, I, I stayed to the end of this because I just wanted to see what was, was how, how it would play out. There were only, a, this room held 800 people. Sat 800 people. And when it was full, it had 800 people in it easily. It's <laughs> down to about maybe 60. He was never invited back to that conference again. <laughs> so that's that's that little vignette of my professional life, early professional life. Well, actually, I'm you know, late professional life after I'd retired too. So it's all kind of fun here, guys. <laughs> bye, bye, YouTubers. <laughs>